The Nutcracker's Suite, An Ever After Mystery, written by Shatona Havig, narrated by Krista Del Sorbo. Chapter 12 Holmes turned the car into a long, tree-covered driveway. Most of the leaves had fallen, but a few clung to their twigs as if refusing to release for anyone or anything. As the driveway curved, she tore her eyes from the mental vision of how beautiful the trees must be in other months and gaped at the side of the house. I thought houses like this had names like Elmhurst or Brookfield. Perhaps I should call it Fortuna. Welcome home, Miss Stahl. I'm sorry this is what brought you. Holmes turned to look over the seat at her. Sometimes Mr. Meyer talked to me, like a friend. He mentioned you, although he never told me your name. It hurt him that he couldn't bring you here. Not enough, apparently. Though she told herself she was being unkind, Clarice decided that she felt unkind. A lonely childhood might have been avoided if her uncle had been an uncle to her. Holmes didn't see her to the door. He hopped back in the car and drove around the house and out of sight before she knew what had happened. There she stood in the rain, gazing up at a house bigger than any she'd ever seen, much less entered. What the style was, she couldn't identify. Three floors. Or was there a small fourth at the top? Imposing. Lots of windows with arches over each one. Rounded not peaked like at the Lutheran church, bleached brick and stone. It may have been beautiful, but something about it seemed cold and hard, too. Double doors flanked by floor-to-ceiling windows, covered in what looked like heavy drapes, left her without any idea of the house inside. Did she knock? Just walk in? Before Clarice could decide, the door opened and a woman wiping her hands on her apron spoke. Oh, dear me, miss. You must be Mr. Meyer's niece. Mr. Hibbert called to say you'd be coming. I hadn't planned for a supper, what with everyone gone. She beckoned for Clarice to enter. Come in, come in. You'll catch your death out in that cold and damp. Now, everyone was given the afternoon off, what with the funeral and all. My man and I live here, though, so we're just going to have our supper and rest in our cottage until I got that call. On and on the woman prattled until Clarice wanted to beg her to stop. She'd made beef pies and creamed peas for supper. Would that do for Miss? Miss would want to see Mr. Meyer's library and study first, wouldn't she? They were famous. How, Clarice couldn't tell. But the woman whose name she still didn't know insisted they were, so that's all that mattered. Outside a dark paneled door, the woman paused. This was Mr. Meyer's study. He spent most of his time in here. If you go through the frosted doors, you'll find the library if you prefer that. Supper's in two hours if you don't mind. And what color do you prefer, yellow or blue? Color? Clarice couldn't see why it mattered. I'll just put you in the yellow room for tonight. They're the only two kept ready for guests, so I thought to ask. The yellow room will be cheerful for you after a day like today. The woman pointed at the desk over by a window. There's an electric buzzer there that connects to the telephone in the kitchen. If you need something, just lift the receiver and push that button. I'll hear you. She turned to go. Um, Mrs. Clarice tried to steady her voice. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Oh, saints preserve us. I've gone and lost my head. I'm Mrs. Gruber. Mr. Meyer always called me grubby. And you can, too, if you like. What an extraordinary nickname. Clarice just smiled. Thank you. I, um... She pulled the envelopes from her pocket. I have a few things to do, so if you need me, I'll be in here or in the other room. Where would I find a washroom if... Down the hall at the very end. Can't miss it. And with that, the woman was gone. Several scents mingled in the room, something slightly earthy which Clarice thought might be the ferns. Perhaps someone had watered them recently. A faint sweetness served as an undertone to ink and wood smoke. When she sat at the desk, she found the source. Pipe tobacco. 
she picked up a pouch and sniffed. Fruity, a bit of floral, a touch of spice. Cigars and cigarettes stank. She had had her fill of them out in the yard at the factory, much less anywhere else, but this... Clarice inhaled another whiff. It smells like him. And yet she'd never known Mr. Meyer smoked a pipe. She'd never seen him anyway. That's something a niece should know about her uncle. What if he'd been wrong? What if he'd left his life's work and savings to the wrong young woman, and there was someone out there who should benefit? Lowering herself into the rich leather chair, Clarice pulled the letter from its envelope and decided she'd start where she left off. Then I'll ask to see where he kept family portraits. A family like this should have one of Mama. And I can still see Mama's face if I concentrate hard enough. Though she'd intended to continue reading as though she hadn't stopped, Clarice began again, taking note of each word until she found that place once more. When I was just twenty-five and my brother and I had come to America to seek our fortunes, we left our sister with an aunt in our little village in northern Germany. It took a few years, but my small store where I made each toy myself grew busy enough that I needed a bigger workroom. Employees. My brother Carl went into banking. In less than ten years, I had a small factory down by what we used to call the dry docks area, and he had risen to manager of his bank. Our aunt died, and Louisa, then just eighteen, needed to come to us. I was a busy man and didn't keep a close enough eye on her. Carl was married and had social responsibilities, so Louisa was left much to her own devices. After just six months here, Hans Stahl had claimed her heart. I refused the marriage. Dear Clarice, I would refuse again today but I would do it with more gentleness and understanding. I would offer hope. Then, I was harsh and so very certain of my rightness, and Carl trusted that I knew what I was about. You will guess the rest. She ran off with Hans. I don't know how they did it, but they evaded my attempts to find them. I learned eventually that in 1906, when Germany did not fare well at the Algeciras Conference, he left Louisa without any money to support the two of you and took a ship home to Germany, confident there would be war and determined to fight for the motherland. Eight years later, he was proven correct, but by then, your dear mother had died. I have never found him. He may have died in the war. I spent those years looking for you all. Back then, I hadn't made the money I have now. I was comfortable, but not wealthy. Only when a detective I hired discovered a death certificate in your mother's name did I give up hope of seeing her again. The search went on for you. Just as I found you, Mario Topo visited my factory. I thought he was there to require protection payments. No one would hurt our machinery or my employees in exchange for those payments or some such thing. I'd heard of it from other factory and store owners. I wish that this were all he required. It was the day that the headlines read, United States Goes Dry, that the detective found you and Mr. Topo found me. He's a shrewd businessman, Clarice. Never underestimate him. I thought his large and rather strange order would be that, a single order, so I decided to wait to meet you. Once he was out of my life, then I would retrieve you from the home and install you in mine. I would introduce you to the world as my niece, and our family would have a piece of Louisa back again. But Mario Topo liked our arrangement, as he called it. When I tried to refuse to meet his demands, Martin was beaten on the way home from school. I couldn't risk him knowing about you, so until I could divorce myself from this unwanted arrangement, I ensured you were safe at the home, that the children in the home had plenty to eat and enough coal to keep warm, and I prayed, like I've never prayed before, that there would be some way out of this. Then the matron of the home contacted me, telling me that you were too old to keep there anymore. She'd heard comments from people that unsettled her, so... 
you came to work for me, and I was forced to try to pretend you meant no more to me than any other employee. This was not easy, my dear. If you're reading this letter, it means I have died before extricating myself from Topo's clutches. Beware of him. Don't cross him. It would probably be best to sell the business and leave Rockland. Go somewhere sunny, warm, and safe. Regardless, be happy and know that you were beloved by a foolish man who thought he could protect you by keeping silent. Forgive me, my dear. Forgive me, but stay safe. You are in a very dangerous position. Never forget that. With love, your uncle, Dietrich Meyer. A door banged somewhere, and a voice called out, Grubby, where is she? Where is that? A few unsavory words drifted into the study, but before Clarice could rise and make it to the door, a man's silhouette filled it. He stepped into the light. Martin Meyer. You little gold digger. I won't let you get away with it. I'll kill you first. He swayed and might have fallen, but Mrs. Gruber appeared behind him. Turn around, Martin. Martin nearly fell as he tried to turn but the woman's hand striking his cheek seemed to snap him out of his rage. He wept, wailing about things Clarice couldn't understand, but she did understand one thing he said, and the words made no sense at all. He said, she killed him. The dining room overwhelmed her. Perhaps it was the enormous table with its dozen chairs for one person. Maybe it was how small that table looked in such an enormous room. Mrs. Gruber bustled in with a tray and set it on the table beside Clarice with a bit of a thud. Begging pardon, miss. I'm still a bit put out at young Martin. No need to take it out on you in the china, is there? I don't know who he thinks I killed, but... Oh, I doubt he meant anything by it. He found some liquor somewhere and it turned his head. Perhaps he meant it was the search for you, or perhaps he meant some other she... We won't know until he wakes. I've put him in his usual room. I hope that's all right. Of course. To herself, Clarice added, He's family, isn't he? The beef pies were so much more than the simple name implied. Clarice's mouth watered in a most unbecoming fashion as Mrs. Gruber slid one onto her plate for her and followed it with bread, peas, and a creamy soup. It isn't much. I forgot to bring the soup out in time, so it's a bit of a hodgepodge. I hope you understand. We'll have a proper Thanksgiving supper for you tomorrow. Will you be eating? How about the rest of the staff? Do they have somewhere to eat a good meal? The woman stopped ladling soup and stared. Why, of course. And my Henry and me, we'll be eating at the cottage after you and the family's had your meal. Clarice's complaint about yet another H in her life fizzled at that last statement. The family? They always come for Thanksgiving because they have Mrs. Maya's family for Christmas, you see. They're coming? Here? Tomorrow? Mrs. Gruber nodded. Of course. She stopped mid-sentence and stared. Unless you'd rather I send a note saying you aren't up to it. Holmes can drive the meal over and I can... Clarice picked up her spoon and dug into the bowl as she interrupted. No, no, I just... A family dinner. She had one decent dress for such an occasion. Not quite fine enough, but the home had been particular about that point. Every girl left with a new work dress, good sturdy work shoes, and one quality black dress for occasions, as Matron put it. Boys left with a good suit and an outfit of work clothes compliments of a generous benefactor. I'll have to sponge my dress, I suppose. What time should I be? Oh, no. You were making up. That is, have a room made up for me. But I have nothing here. I need to go back to my room at the boarding house, my clothes and things. Make a list and write a note for your landlady. Holmes will drive around and pack it up for you. It's his job she added when Clarice would have protested. 
Another question formed and dissolved with the first bite of beef pie, whose crust disintegrated at the touch of a fork. She would eat a good meal, go into her uncle's library, her library, that is, and think. I have so many things to think about. I'll let Holmes know to be ready for your list at uh, seven o'clock. Even as she nodded her agreement, Clarice's thoughts continued. Think and plan, I suppose. The meat pie disappeared before she knew what had happened. Clarice pulled the soup bowl closer and found it empty as well. Peas had never been her favorite, but a grumbling stomach demanded more, so she ate them and the dinner bread as well. She'd been about to rise when Mrs. Gruber returned, carrying a plate of chocolate cake the size of which Clarice had never seen. I reckon you haven't had a good meal today, what with the funeral and all. I thought you could use something sweet. It's my Henry's favorite. He used to like to claim his mother's Sasha tort was the best dessert ever made, but I gave him a piece of cake one afternoon, and he asked me to marry him on the spot. I can imagine why. This looks heavenly. That first bite dissolved in her mouth without the need for chewing. Oh, my. There is more in the kitchen under the dome, on the table if you get peckish in the night. Will there be anything else? She started to shake her head, her mouth being too busy absorbing the deliciousness of the cake. But a thought stopped her. Clarice held up a finger and swallowed. Oh, yes. Where do I bring my dishes when I'm done? I don't know where that kitchen is. The woman gave her a genuine smile as she scooped up the dirty china. You just go out the door and turn left. Walk until you find yourself in the warmest room of the house. It's fine in the cold months and miserable in summer. The cake disappeared almost as fast as Mrs. Gruber and her supper. It felt rude to leave dirty dishes at the table, but halfway down the hall to the kitchen, Clarice felt awkward arriving with them and scurried back to leave them at her place. Maybe when I've been here a while. She stopped by her uncle's desk on the way to the library. With a few sheets of paper and an envelope in hand, she grabbed his fountain pen and, at the last moment, the tobacco pouch. With care not to wrinkle the paper, she carried it all to the frosted pocket doors that separated study from library and jostled things until she could unlatch the doors and nudge them apart. The light from the study sent warm glows and shadows through different corners of the room. A reading lamp stood in the middle of a library table, so Clarice dumped everything there and pulled the chain. Warm, amber light filled the space, and the room took on an even lovelier quality. Rows upon rows of spines. Beautiful ones with gold foil and filigree work tooled into leather. Stared back at her as if daring her to skip all the responsible things she knew she should be doing and lose herself in the pages of a book. As a young girl, she'd loved to make her way to the Carnegie Library, enter the beautiful building with its rows and rows of books, pick out the allotted two she could borrow, and race home to their little flat to lose herself in the world of Oz with Dorothy and Toto, or that of the pirates in Treasure Island. At the home, Reading had become a luxury for the classroom alone, and since moving away from there, Clarice hadn't let herself take up that habit again. You never knew when the joy of it might be stripped away. She flicked away a tear and pulled out the sheets of paper. The fountain pen was a fine one, hefty and solid, beautiful. Every sound the house made sent her into jitters that Clarice finally attributed to her using something without permission. But it's mine now, as strange as that is. Hers or not, it didn't feel like it, and feelings always demanded an audience, even at the expense of truth. Instead of an itemized list, something that she likely couldn't do, Clarice wrote a short note to Mrs. Thacker and explained the change in her circumstances. She requested that Holmes be allowed to retrieve her things and asked that the woman be certain he looked under the bed and in all of the drawers. She closed the letter with gratitude for the woman's kindness 
and, at the end, added a postscript. P.S. I would appreciate it if you would hold my room for me until after the first of the year. Holmes will give you the rent through then. Between us, I don't trust this windfall. You can reach me at the factory any time you like, or at Mr. Meyer's home. Holmes will have the address. Thank you. With that settled, she hopped up to find an envelope, and seeing the buzzer, lifted the receiver and pressed it. Mrs. Gruber's voice came on the line almost immediately. Yes, miss? Is there some sort of household account I might borrow from until more, that is, Friday? I need to give Holmes money for Mrs. Thacker. Certainly, but you don't need to borrow from yourself, dear. You look in the third drawer to the right. There's a leather pouch there with everything you could need, and if not, there's a safe. The pouch was there, and so was enough money to keep her landlady satisfied. Thirty dollars would reserve the room through the first of the year. She could revisit it then. Clarice punched the buzzer again and picked up the receiver. When had she put it down? No one came on the line. She pressed it again, slowly, carefully. Mrs. Gruber came on. Find it, dearie? Yes. Where do I go to give this to Mr. Holmes? He'll be right in to get it. You stay put. It's frightful out there. While she waited, Clarice pulled another sheet of paper toward her and began scribbling notes about everything. The night Mr. Meyer had been killed, the next day at the factory, with the police, with Detective Doyle, Mr. Ellison at the funeral, peppermints on Mr. Dalton's desk, Martin Meyer's illogical assertion that she, whoever that was, had killed Uncle Meyer. Where is Milo? She whispered to herself. Maybe he could make sense of this. She went over the list again, her mind insisting she'd found something, but whatever that something was remained elusive. Every second of every day flashed before her. She captured memories, held them, and pondered them before allowing them to race on as if on the wings of the fastest bird in the world. Five minutes after Holmes had retrieved the note and promised to return promptly, Clarice stared at a line she'd drawn on the paper. A simple line between a hat and a missing Milo. Tune in tomorrow for the next chapter. Thanks for listening.